After the last video, some folks offered their suggestions for what might cause the number 5 crossbar to drop a trouble card. In this video, we'll try out some of them, and if we do get a card, we'll do a basic analysis to see what actually went wrong. Let's start off with some suggestions from Twitter. Will C, Nico May, and Jeff Dopkin all suggest flashing the hook switch 11 times while dialing a number. Will dialing 11 pulses drop a card? Yep. So the number that you dialed uh, was two, three, two, nine, nine, one. And interestingly, it just... Okay, so I guess what happened here on the G digit is it overflowed to register only a zero, which is weird. I actually didn't, I didn't know what the behavior would be. Um, we actually dropped two cards because it tried with, it tried first with marker zero and then a second time with marker one. But because you dialed 11 pulses into the register, it doesn't matter what marker it's going to try. It's gonna fail either way. It could try with any marker. Um, you can see that this card was the first trial because one TR is punched. And this card up here is the second trial because two TR is punched. And um, interestingly, different timers expired on each trial. So the first trial was a work timer and the second trial was a short timer. I don't know why that is. Um, but yeah, we can see that the last digit just looks like it overflowed to register a zero on both calls. And that would definitely drop a card because each of the register uh, readings have to be two out of five, and all the other ones are two. Panda says, flashing the hook switch inconsistently. Will flashing the hook switch inconsistently drop a card? Yes. Okay, what do we got here? Um, trouble indication, marker one, first trial. Ah, subscriber outgoing. So the marker managed to decode the office code and it considered it an outgoing call, meaning it's a call that's gonna leave this office. Um, it was a call that originated here, which is true. That makes sense, it originated from a phone here. And the marker asked local translator one to do the translation for us, which means the first digit the marker detected out of Astrid's hook, hook switch flashing was a one. So out of all that random tapping of the hook switch, the marker saw a one as the first digit. So it called in the local translator one, which will handle that case. And then it looks like it just read in a bunch of digits. So it, Astrid managed to dial a four one, two, two, one, whoa, <laughs> two, one, something, six. So four, one, two, two, one, something, six. And that's why the marker dropped the card because it did not like the three out of five registration right there. But it did at least get to the point where it decided it was an outgoing call based on the uh, the prefix one, which is registered right here, and the indication that it's a subscriber outgoing SOG call. And uh, what else did it do? Um, it went so far as to try to get us a sender. So here's our, it got a sender zero and group zero, which is an MF sender. Right, because we've got one plus where it translated directly to a particular route. Yeah. And it's, what's funny about this, actually, what I like about this card is that 
what it reveals to us is that the marker tries to parallelize a lot of things, right? Because we can see that even though it was, even though the information that got to the marker was wrong in that in the what digit is that in the F digit, um, it still tried to parallelize the process of getting a sender and choosing a trunk because it did actually pick a sender before it decided that the 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 tens or units digit it got was garbage. And that's just because it, the marker will branch out and parallelize as much as possible. So for a brief second, it had a sender and it actually uh, picked a trunk. Right here, we got the outgoing trunk, which was a, a trunk to CNET. Uh, so out to the D4 bank. And yeah, like all this here says that we got a trunk. So the marker parallelized enough that it went it skipped way beyond the validation stage and set up the you know set up some of the some of the switching fabric and then finally got to the validation point and was like oh yeah no actually no Avery T says I should point out hold MRL in the off state when the marker wants to release the OR the marker will be unhappy that it can't release the OR when it wants to Yes, it did drop a card. Interestingly, it dropped a card, but the call still completed. So uh, we got Usually we got two cards, a first trial and a second trial. These are both the same error. It's just that it, it tried with one marker, one marker failed, it tried with the second marker, the second marker failed. Actually, these are, these are even different errors. Why did we not get any trunk information on the first trial? Weird, okay, two, three, two, zero, zero, one, five? Two three two zero zero one five. Weird. Okay. My guess is, and I haven't looked at the schematic for this. I don't know this for a fact, but my my educated wild ass guess is that because we held MRL, the marker was unable to release the register, and because the marker was unable to effectively complete the release of the register whatever mechanism serves to lock in those readings in the marker never completed. Probably because it's dependent on releasing the register successfully. That's my guess, if I had to like just troubleshoot this. Um, the right sides are also very different. The right sides are also very different and I actually don't know why that is. Um, let's see. So this one is marker O, and this is the first trial. This is marker one, and this is the second trial. Um, marker O got nowhere. And why was high traffic punched if we were the only call in the machine and it was a first trial? And the work timer expired. Right, and the second indication didn't show any timer expiring, although it obviously dropped a card, so something had to go wrong. Um, and the second one said cross, uh, cross TB, cross TGI, cross TS, and cross line vert. That, ah, uh, maybe, 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 maybe. Maybe. The second trial was a route to permanent signal or intercept, and maybe that route failed for some other reason, right? So like, 
Again, I haven't looked at the schematics. I don't know what the sequence chart is for this behavior. I can look, but it's possible that there are some failures where the first marker will, will kind of like shrug its shoulders and pass it off to the second marker. They'll be like, I don't know what to do with this, so you give it a try. Maybe our markers are also configured differently. Right, that's the other thing. But, but wait, so the first marker passes off to the second marker. The second marker goes, I also don't know what to do with this, but I understand that I am the second trial because that indication does get passed along. The second marker goes, I also don't know what to do with this. I understand that I'm a second trial, so I am now going to choose to route this call to some kind of intercept. And it could be that in routing the call to intercept, for whatever reason, the second marker had encountered some kind of failure with the intercept that it tried to route the call to. Now, in order to determine if that's true or not, I would have to go through an entire analysis on this ticket because I've never seen a card exactly like this before. So I'd have to follow the sequence chart through and it would probably take me a couple of hours, which I'm totally not going to do here on this video. Sorry. And this failure is just like, I gave up really fast. Nope. I still don't know why high traffic is punched there. That's weird. Um, high traffic, you should only get that punching if there's there has been a call to this marker within a second, and this is the a second call within one second of time. So I don't know why high traffic's punched there. Weird. Anyway, it drops a card. Gary T says, I've heard that at one time, a card was dropped when ringing a line with no ringer present, i.e. very high impedance at 20 hertz. There must have been some way to option or strap this off. Well, Gary, for that, we have to talk about continuity test, line polarity test, and ground test. And there was indeed a way to option and strap this off with these keys right here. So this, uh, this is gonna require a little bit of explaining these three keys and these three lights. There's a thing that markers do um, in all these common control systems, namely the number five and the number one they'll do a continuity test, and sometimes they'll do a line polarity test and a ground test. Now, they will try to complete that test any time they are completing a call to a phone in this office. So, um, if you get an inbound call to a phone in this machine, or if you call an intra-office call from a phone to a phone in this machine, it's gonna try to do one of these tests. Now. In order to complete this test, there's some really wacky electrical theory going on. Um, I will give you the short version. Uh, there is a tube that has to fire when the conduct, you know, when the voltage difference across each side of this tube gets to a certain point across this capacitor in parallel. It's this wacky thing. Um, this tube will become conductive and it will fire, and it's arranged. So the tube will only fire if there is continuity from the subscriber's tip all the way out through their phone and through their ringer all the way back on the ring, okay? And we cancel that test so that tube will never fire, it's just bypassed. Um, and the reason we cancel it is because many times in order for that test to pass, it relies on a certain amount of capacitance in the subscriber's pair, in their loop. And that capacitance is only there if the loop is of a sufficient length, like up to at least a mile-ish in length. So we ran into this problem in the number one, I was testing this out, the continuity test in the terminating marker over there is permanently canceled, and I started wondering why it is. It turns out that none of the phones we have here in the museum are a mile away from the switch. In fact, the phone that we've been calling from is, I don't know, 20 feet away from the switch. So if we dial that phone, there isn't enough capacitance or resistance in that line to a range of, you know, this voltage difference for the tube to fire. 
and I, God, I promise you, if you want to see the schematic, I'll give it to you, but I'm not going to try to explain the whole thing right now. Um, anyway, we have to cancel the test. If we don't cancel the test, all calls will always fail. You want to demonstrate it? Sure. Okay, so we're going to, um, we're gonna force marker O, um, and then we are going to cancel these tests, and then I'm going to place a call to that phone over there, which you said was 0345, right? Mm -hmm. And it's funny because it rings anyway. So it allows the call to complete, but in doing so, it'll drop a card. Let me get my pen. And see what we're missing here is the con punching because the continuity test failed and we thus do not get a con punching, but it did allow the call to complete. It's just, if you saw this card, you would say that yeah, the call went through okay, but there's a continuity failure on the subscriber's line. And in this case, it's because the phone is 20 feet away. Jeff Dobkins suggests using the A, B, C, D digits on a 16 key keypad. The answer? No. Jeff also suggests dialing anything that the marker has no route for. This is the first trial here on top. This is the second trial on the bottom. We busied out marker one because we only changed the cross connect in marker O. So marker one would have completed the call just fine. So they were both trials were with marker O. And um, since this was, since this card was the second trial, we got a high traffic punching here telling us that the previous request for this marker was within about one second. So these two cards were punched within one second of each other, which we know because we saw it anyway, but that's just what tells us that. Um, and the time is exactly the same on here and on there. Anywho, so we dialed two, three, one, five, 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 five. The marker died at TSE. And TSE means trunk selection end, but I bet it didn't actually finish trunk selection. It's gonna be a IAO? No, IMG. Wrong book. outgoing trunk call. So what we do is we grab our card and we got TM, CKG, GTL, and TSE. So what we gotta find is the key progress indications. TSE. Yep, and then just before it, CKG. So there, this box shows you trunk link and trunk selection. So that's what's happening with all the punches that exist in this box. So we got TSE, but that's really, we just entered this box. That's like the first step. We didn't get down to all of these guys, which actually show that uh, trunk selection took place. And it didn't take place because the translation didn't occur. Um, but see, the marker is gonna parallelize a lot of stuff. 
So in addition to trunk selection here, we might actually end up having other punches that we could look for to see what else it was trying to do. Um, here's the route translation here, which absolutely should have failed. And if route translation succeeded, we should get SON or NSO or OSG. And we got none of those. And we didn't get OSG either, right there. So this is, these punches are all indications that route translation succeeded. And then TB, TG, and TG, U. We didn't get any of those either. Those are all right here. So these punchings tell us which trunk was actually chosen and which trunk the marker is actually going to use for the call. And these punchings here tell us whether or not a sender was required for this outgoing call. And the marker answered neither of those questions for us. So if I was troubleshooting this, I would see TSE, I would see none of these, and I would be really concerned that we did not pass the translation phase because in order for trunk selection to succeed, we have to translate first. Florence suggests feeding it nonsense MF digits, which I'll tell you right now will absolutely drop apart. The reason I know that is because IR number one is currently busied out for exactly that reason. The, uh, the MF receiver in that register is no good. It's been problematic despite my attempts to adjust it and every time it gets a call on that register, the thing drops a card. So I'm not even gonna demo that just because I know for a fact it'll drop a card and I know it'll be a two out of five error. Anyway, I hope that was entertaining for you. Um, if you like these videos, go ahead and do that subscribe button -y thing because uh, I don't know, the. Like I said last time, the computer likes it or something, algorithm bullshit. So if you want one of these cards, either either one of these very cards that have been touched by me, ooh, um, you can- Or other cards that have been touched by or, you. Yes, or literally any card that has been touched by me, because I'll be the one mailing it. Um, if you would like one of these cards, and you wouldn't mind sending us a donation that covers the approximate shipping of one of these rolled up into a shipping tube, uh, I will be glad to mail one out to you. Right now, the only way to donate to us is at the Winchester Mansion that is our website. That's at connectionsmuseum.org and there's a donate form. And in the donate form, you can put your address and if you have any special requests. Um, those donate forms are read by one of us volunteers, not by random hired humans. So if you put your address in there, it'll be private. It's, it's literally me reading it and then doing what I have to do. So anyway, thanks. Bye. Bye.